Good morning. I had practiced to say it in Icelandic, Finnish, Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish, but the, the nerves got the better of me. <laughs> so I shall just say it in English and American. Good morning. Um, can I steal one of the, these, these, these things are very expensive and I always drop them <laughs> and the sound people hate me. So would you, could I have the, thank you very much. It is, uh, I speak on behalf of my wife and myself, it is a very great pleasure, delight. Should I use this one? No? Swap. Is that, that going to go? Meanwhile, I will shout. So, we should use this one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, you clap because it's an improvement. <laughs> no, seriously, um, Eleanor and I love you lot. And um, we, it is an honor and a, a genuinely a privilege. I remember years ago, a man called John Wimber, some of you may have heard of. He was the person that God used to start this thing we call the vineyard. And somebody, he had spoken somewhere or done something very well. And somebody went up to him to congratulate him. And in his delightful, humble way, he said, uh, thank you very much for saying that to me. I shall take the encouragement and I shall pass on the glory. I thought it was rather good. I'll take the encouragement because we all need encouragement, but I'll, we're, we're all very clear, are we not, that what has happened here in this country, what has happened in the UK, what has happened around the world in the body of Christ, including the vineyard, is uh, the work of God who has made things grow. So. It is, as I say, I'm delighted to be here. This morning is slightly unusual in that, as Jan said, we're sort of in two parts, and the focus really is upon leadership and different aspects of leadership, not least with um, the very terrible, the very frightful, the very awful Mr. and Mrs. Merlew, Fleming and Anne. Uh, has nobody warned you about them? <laughs> very good. How are we doing? Good. Fine. Uh, and my assumption is that in this, just in this room this morning, we have a, a spectrum of people. That there are some people who have a very clear understanding of the vineyard and understand what it's, and you've been around, if I may say, you've been around for donkey's years. That's an English expression. Love that it. means you're old, really. It's a polite way of saying you're old, uh, which many of us are, though we disguise it you know, with surgery and, you know, all sorts of ways, um, and makeup. Um, some of us are very old. On the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum, there are people here who are very new to the vineyard. You've not been around. Maybe this is the first conference you've ever been to, vineyard conference. Uh, it may be that you're still, you know, trying to work out what are all this and what's installation. What on earth is that? It sounds like, you know, a new kitchen being put into your house. Do you install a kitchen? Do you, no, maybe you don't. We do in England, we install kitchens. <coughs> so, um, bearing that in mind, let me say that, oh, the first, <laughs> I really ought to say that if you came here this morning expecting to hear John Wright, as opposed to John Mumford, you're deeply disappointed because I am not John Wright. <laughs> Praise God, <laughs> some of you are saying. Uh, poor man, um, John, uh, He's never ill, is never unwell, uh, and was struck down with flu and was literally confined to his bedroom. So he. Ah, excuse me. Please, um, I, yeah, you are excused.
and, uh, and anyhow, um, John, uh, John and Debbie aren't here. You may be interested to know, you may not, um, that Ellen and I have led the vineyard in the United Kingdom and Ireland for the last 20, how many years, sweetheart? 28 years, I think it is. And, um, and then uh, earlier this year, there was a coup d'etat. <laughs> John and Debbie rolled their tanks onto our lawn. And they seized the barracks, the vineyard barracks, and they seized the television station. And uh, we, were, we were hurried away in a helicopter um, and were last seen floating down a river, <laughs> upside down, with bullet marks in the back. Okay, so you get the point. Um, we're in a transition in the United Kingdom. And we announced it, we've been working on it for th four or five years, we announced it in January of this last year, and John and Debbie technically take over as the national leaders for the UK and Ireland in September, but in effect, they're, they're already doing it. And so we've been in a process of transition, and we, I can't tell you how delighted we are with the, the process. They, John and Debbie are very dear friends of ours, we've worked together for many years, and it was obvious it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us that this was God's choice. Um, they're younger than us, and it was just an appropriate thing to do, so we're in the process. And if you promise not to tell anybody, <laughs> the truth, the honest truth is that um, if it doesn't sound arrogant or proud, the honest truth is I, Ellen and I can't think of a, a way that this transition could have gone better. Um, with these transitions, you know as much as I do that the key to it is the relationship between the outgoing leader and the incoming leader, and the trust and respect there is. And um, we're all in this vineyard thing together. It doesn't belong to any of us, it belongs to the Lord. And they are God's choice, so um, they're going to take over. And. Um, so it's doubly disappointing they're not here to lay hands on uh, Fleming and Anna, but never mind. So we're going to talk, let me just talk a little bit, can I, about the international, just, just stand back. Again, I'm thinking particularly of those of you for whom all this is very new. If you stand back and look at, that is a, a relatively recent map of the countries in blue in which the vineyard has been called by God to plant and develop churches. I think the total, I think I'm right in saying it's 56, 80, oh, my wife, is, I, I always forget numbers. And she always exaggerates. So between us, you get a very distorted view. So of the three million countries there are in the world, the vineyard is in three and a half million. All right, how are we doing? It's somewhere in the ages. So, the truth is, in the last 20 years, vineyards have begun to pop up like mushrooms in a wood. And the same happened here. 20, when did the vineyard start? When was the first? 92, the first mushroom of the vineyard popped up in the Nordic region. And, and look, look how God has developed and, and grown and prospered. And again, for those of you who don't, aren't aware of this, what happens is if God chooses to start vineyards in various nations, um, our plan has been all along is that when there are a sufficient number, a sort of critical mass, if you like, of vineyard churches in a particular nation such that they can... Uh, lead themselves, govern themselves, finance themselves, um, sustain themselves, propagate themselves, start new churches and so on. We have said, once they get to that stage, we will lay hands on them and they will become responsible for the vineyard's leadership and development in that country. And the other thing we've said is, we, but we won't do that until a national leader has emerged to lead that nation from that nation. 
In other words, John Wimber said long ago, I'm not going to parachute in an American or a Brit or a Swiss to lead churches in the Nordic area, any more than I'm going to parachute in uh, a Brazilian to lead a church, to lead the Vineyard family in Australia, do you see? So the Australians have an Australian leader, and the Nordics have a Nordic leader. And that's the way, and there are now 11 nations around the world it, that are now established vineyard families in their own right in that nation. And the 12th takes place later this year in Zambia. It's, no, oh, again, my wife is arguing with me. Darling, do you want to come and talk? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's the trouble. <laughs> Shall we have a vote? No, 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 let's not have a vote, actually, on second thoughts, because I, I might lose rather embarrassingly. Uh, no, 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 never thought the idea. Never thought the idea. Uh, never thought of the idea. So, um, and, and looking at it, looking at, the, oh, looking at the globe, don't, don't worry, don't worry. Looking at the globe, within the next 10 years, it's not at all unlikely that there'll be another five or 10 different vineyard families established. For example, in uh, uh, the uh, Himalaya region, where they've had the in Kathmandu, where they've had that terrible earthquake, the the number of vineyards in in Nepal, Nepal and North India, it's the same people group. They just somebody drew a map, some stupid English colonial bureaucrat drew a line in a in, you know on a map, and separated the two. But it's basically one people group, and they're close to becoming their own. Brazil is in the same con position. Chile is in the same position. Mexico is in the same position. Uh, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, where the vineyard families are growing. God is giving us growth and increase. And we need to recognize that this is what he's doing. And then once these vineyard families are established, then there's no one overall, overall arching government. The Nordics are responsible for the leadership of the vineyard in the Nordics and the Brits and so on and so forth. And we'll just work together as friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the idea. So that all of us can do... Do you, do you remember the um, American preacher, Jonathan Edwards, in the 18th century? He said that the task of... I, I wrote it down last night, actually. I rem remembered that I had found it. The task of every generation is to discover in which direction the sovereign redeemer is moving and then to move in that direction. The task of every generation, so let's just talk about the Nordic, the five Nordic nations and you lot. It is the task of your generation in these Nordic countries as it is with the Americans in the US and the Brits in the UK to discover in which direction the sovereign redeemer is moving. Don't you love that idea? So that de developing churches and developing movement of churches isn't a sort of stagnant thing where everything gets set in concrete and you have to do it like this. No, no, to discover in which direction God is leading, the sovereign redeemer is moving. And then to move in that direction with all the risk that is entailed and the fear that needs to be overcome, as Jay so beautifully talked about last night. And it's wonderfully exciting. So, and in, in the case of the Nordic nations, I think I'm right, was it 1988 we laid hands on you at the summer camp? Or can, was it 88? I'm pretty certain. At your, Nord, at the, your summer camp. Uh, uh, yes, in uh, 1988. Um, I told you, <laughs> I told you about numbers. 19, forgive me, 1990, because I was there, we were there. We were there and Bob Fulton was there, it was about a year, a little over a year after Wimber had died. No, it was less than that, less than a year after Wimber's death. And we came, we had a big old party and you became established. And um, those of you who've been around for any length of time know that there have been difficulties along the way. And the water got a bit choppy, as we say in the United Kingdom. And the wind blew, <coughs> and there were difficulties, but that was six years ago. But look now where you are. Look what God has done. It's a wonderful thing. And may I just briefly 
press the pause button. And may I, I want to pay tribute to those of you who were around eight, six, eight, ten years ago. And you've been through thick and thin. And um, it's been difficult for you, it's been painful. But I want to pay tribute to you because you have helped um, establish a build a foundation here upon which you this is what this is the growth that you have seen and um, it's a wonderful thing but it um, and God has done it but I don't want having said that I don't want it to escape your understanding that um, there are men and women in this room who paid a very high price and have been remained faithful to the Lord and to his purposes and to what, as Jonathan Edwards put it, the, the, we have seen the sovereign redeemer doing in this generation, in this part of the globe. And we thank God for it. And we look forward to the future. And this, so this is a landmark, just so that you understand, without getting too sentimental or too self-important, today is a landmark, another landmark, in the history and the development of what God is doing in the vineyard in the Nordic countries as we lay hands on Fleming and Anna. It's an, it's an, it's an important day. And it's not just about them. That's the point I want to make. It's not just about them. What I would like to do um, f uh, during the rest of the morning is I'm going to talk for a, a little bit more, then we'll have a coffee break and coffee will be served intravenously if you need it. You know, we could put up a drip and you could just lie down, you know, and you can get your caffeine that way. And then um, after that, we're going to have, um, we're going to lay hands on them and I'm going to call them and you to remind you of what God has called you to and together we're going to commit ourselves to it. So this is something for all of you who are in this room as indeed there are many of you who haven't, aren't able to be here for a variety of reasons but we in our minds and our thinking and our prayers we include them all. So the spotlight is on leadership. And um, if you have a Bible within reach or failing that some digital device if you promise not to do your emails or to look at the football scores on the internet, then you can open your Bible. <laughs> and I would like you to turn to uh, Paul's first letter to Timothy. Uh, and if you've got get stuck, just turn to the maps at the back and then work forwards and you'll hit it fairly soon. Uh, first, Paul wrote a number of letters to Timothy, two, at least two of which are captured in the New Testament. We call them 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And I want to look at chapter 3. May I, let me just say by way of introduction, this, um, Paul, Paul is writing at the end of his life, um, Almost certainly, the pundits tell us that these are the last two letters that, uh, of, that Paul wrote in his life uh, before he was, as legend has it, uh, he was executed in Rome. He may have written other letters. All I'm saying is that uh, they weren't captured in the New Testament. So he's re writing right at the end of his life. He's by now elderly, um, covered in bruises and scars, both... Um, physical and emotional, no doubt, from the way in which he has served the Lord faithfully over decades. And here is a wise old man who's seen it all and done it all when it comes to loving people and serving people and preaching the gospel and building churches. He's seen it all, done it all, got every T-shirt that is available. <laughs> and um, is, so it's well worth us as a relatively new, you know, in the, in the history, in the overall history of Christianity and the body of Christ, we're newcomers. We're still, we're still um, babies in, well, we call them nappies. What do you call them? Diapers? I'm sorry. The Americans call them diapers. I do apologize. They can't help it, but it's embarrassing. But, um, and we, the reason I'm, I'm so into diapers at the moment is that 
uh, we have two boys and the older one and his wife have produced, well, I was going to say our first granddaughter. I should technically say their first child, but much more importantly, our first granddaughter. <laughs> and uh, she's just, I'm talking of diapers. Diapers make a very good vehicle for, mo oh, my wife is doing like that in the front. Um, she, at the moment, she has a technique of using her diapers to propel herself as a sort of launch pad. And she, she goes backwards. She crawls backwards on her bottom, on her diapers. Do you see? Back to the Bible. Anyhow. Uh, thank you. Uh, that, this all comes out of verse 4. So here is Paul writing to the younger Timothy, his protege, someone who's been mentoring, training. Paul, uh, Timothy is leading the church in Ephesus. And uh, if you've never, uh, again, I, I say, I've said several times, I am speaking to a room full of leaders now. I doubt you'd be here if you weren't leading in some capacity. Some of you are, are leading a small group. Some of you are about to lead a small group and you, you've snuck in here, great. Uh, some of you uh, lead children's ministry, some of you lead ministry with youth, some of you lead musicians, some of you lead this and that and whatever, ministry of the poor teams or whatever it is, some of you lead churches, some of you lead um, clusters of churches as well as leading your local church. But I'm speaking to you as leaders, and it, which is essentially what Timothy, what Paul was doing to Timothy writing to him in his capacity as a leader of the church. And some, it's, honestly, it's a gold mine. First and second Timothy and Titus. And if you've never really dug yourself into it, you ought to, because you have a treat in store. You'll love it. If you say, hang on, John, just a moment, what do you mean by a leader? What, 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 what are you talking about? Because some of us have slightly distorted views of leadership, don't we? And we think, you know, we look at... Anne, or possibly Fleming, and we say, well, they're so full of the Lord and full of the Holy Spirit, I could never be. If, if that's leadership, I'll never be one of those. No, that's not quite what we mean. Um, the best definition, well, during the Second World War, there was um, an English general who was a, quite a, he was a fairly good general, and he was a very, very skilled self-publicist. His name was uh, Montgomery. Bernard Montgomery, and uh, um, he said of leadership, he was a soldier, but his definition of leadership, I think, works for ministry as well as it does for the military. He said, leadership is the capacity and will to rally men and women to a common purpose and the character which will inspire confidence. So he puts two, into his definition, he puts two aspects the capacity and will to rally men and women to a common purpose and the character which will inspire confidence. And you know as well as I do that as you read through the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, time and time and time and time again, you see when talking about leadership, the Bible authors talk quite as much about character as they do about skill and the capacity to, to lead. So the capacity, he says, Montgomery says, the capacity and will to rally men and women to a common purpose. So that could ab apply to someone who's leading the youth group in your church or someone who's leading a small group in your church. It's rallying men and women who come to their group. You know, when we started our first group, on the first evening, come on, help me with numbers, darling. On the first evening, the very first house group evening in our front room, we had nine, including us. If we had a cat, we would have included the cat, which would have made us 10, because we were that desperate for numbers. That was the first Thursday. A week later, guess how many we had? Revival broke out. Guess how many we had? Eight. <laughs> so immediately, we weren't into church growth, but into church shrinkage. Welcome to pastoral ministry. Welcome to church planting. That's just the way it works. That's just reality. So what was it, uh, Carl, you were saying that numbers don't matter? Well, they clearly don't when you drop from eight to seven. I mean, nine to eight. So um, 
you know, a, a young couple are leading a group and they're leading a small group and they think, well, what are we going to do? You know, we've, uh, we're starting this small group and, uh, we, I mean, what, 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 what do we do? Well, um, we probably ought to get some coffee because you can't, in Nordic, you can't do anything without coffee before you even think about starting anything. And then we probably need some chocolate to go with the coffee. Again, this is Nordic and, well, it's actually godly to have chocolate and coffee. <laughs> um, it's in the Bible here. It's, I can show you that. Um, a Toblerone is quite good, if you don't mind Swiss. Chocolate. You could do Cadbury's, which is British. Anyhow, we won't discuss any further now the chocolate. We could have a seminar this afternoon about which is the best chocolate to do. I quite like marzipan with covered in chocolate. Never mind. Um, and then you think, well, we got a, we, in our small group, what else are we going to do? Well, let's worship together. Shall we do that? Yeah, and so you could find someone with a guitar and they can string a few chords together and we'll worship the Lord. And then maybe we'll look at the Bible together and then we'll fellowship together and pray for one another and then we'll drink more coffee and eat more chocolate at the end. Do you see? And you do that and the first week, nine people turn up, in the second week, eight people turn up, in the third week, somebody brings a friend and you have 10 people. And then you, you, you and this young couple look at each other and say, goodness me, week four, 11 people have come. Oh, what has happened? Why, what, what are they doing here? Why do they come? Any of you had an experience like that? What, what, why, why, they, why do they come? Answer. Because God has put something in you that is called leadership. And people want to hang around you. Because they want to hang around you, they like you, and they want to hang around God, and they like him, and they find him in you. And that's really what it is. And one of the best definitions, another definition, a lead, what is a leader? Literally, it's nothing more than someone who has a following. You know, here you are, you, you and this young couple are starting a small group in the church and they turn around and there are nine people who want to come. Then a month later they turn around and there are 12. And then again, oh, six months later there are 14. Oh, oh dear, I need to, I need to lie down in a darkened room. This is too shocking. <laughs> what do you do? What do you, and if any of you are leaders here, there have been times when you've turned around and said, what are you doing here? Why, what, what are you doing? Oh, we just want to be here. Is it all right? Yes, of course it's right. Come in, on in. Yeah, love to. <laughs> Do you see, that's how it works. So leadership isn't being a size 10 personality. It isn't being, you don't have to be an extrovert to be a leader. You can perfectly easily be an introvert. I mean, leaders, look around the room. Just look around them. You're a pretty rum bunch, aren't you? Look around, go on, you're allowed to look around. You're a pretty odd bunch, if I may put it politely. <laughs> Godly and odd. I mean, you're very mixed. There's no, thank God, there's no stereotype. You're not all wearing suits and ties and sort of what you Americans call cookie cutter, just, you know, all the same. No, 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 God uses all sorts of personalities. People of every gender, well, I mean both genders, because you've only got two to choose from. <laughs> Though in Canada, I, I let you, uh, you need to know that in Canada, you walk in, there's a hospital in Ottawa, and you walk into the front entrance in the foyer, and the toilets, the lavatories, the loos, are over to one side, and there aren't two, there are three. One for men, one for women, and one for pastors. <laughs> yes. So clearly we're a third gender, <laughs> which is confusing in this current debate about sexuality. So anyhow, Whatever your educational background, whatever your cultural background, whatever your background in or out of the church, whatever, 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 God uses everybody. I don't think we create leaders, I think God does. And God gives us, puts into us something that people, people just want to hang around and follow. It's not that we go coercing them like a sheepdog, you know, snapping at their heels. No, 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 we just do what we do and people want to hang around. It's influence. Leadership really is influence. And as I say, much as that, as you'll see from, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we'll read a bit of 3 and a bit of 4. 
Here is a trustworthy saying. 1 Timothy 3 verse 1. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. So that immediately tells, you something, tells us something about leadership, doesn't it? First of all, it's okay to aspire to it. So it's okay, Paul anticipates, that you will actually want to. You'll be ambitious to be a leader. Oh, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that in the church. You actually want to be a leader. Goodness me, you must have an ego the size of Spain. No, no, no. We conf in the church, we, we confuse. When we talk about ambition, most people default to ungodly. And there are two types of ambition in the Bible. You know that as well as I do. There's ungodly ambition and there's godly ambition. And when we use the A word, most people default to ungodly ambition. I'm saying wrong default. Naughty, naughty, smack body, don't do it. <laughs> no, 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 no. no it's, it's good to be ambitious. We need leaders. We need you lot. God needs you lot in the Nordic region here to be ambitious. That's what Jay was talking about last night, about taking risks and being prepared to fail. But that presupposes ambition, aspiring to be leaders. Now, if you're worried about, oh, yes, but if we, if we have people who, if we encourage people to be ambitious, then we get an awful lot of proud people. My experience is the vast majority of us, if we have a problem with ungodly ambition, if we do, it's something that God can sort out very, very easily and very quickly. I promise you. I'm giving you my testimony now. I'm bearing all. Because the truth is, how, how, does, how is it we are able to lead with ambition and vision and drive and stay humble? Oh, it's very, very easy, I promise you. God will just give you enough failure and disappointment and setbacks and heartache and failure. Did I mention failure? <laughs> promise you. Promise you. So most of us crawl into bed last thing at night don't we? And say, oh God, oh God, oh God, I love you, but please help me to do it better tomorrow. <laughs> Isn't that right? Not many of us crawl into bed and go, oh, well done, John, you did have an awfully good day today. <laughs> oh, well done. <laughs> yeah, we don't do that. So, aspire to leadership and they desire a noble task. Leadership, ladies and gentlemen, is a noble task. Say that. It is a, that runs country, doesn't it, to what our culture says. More and more, in the last 20 years, more and more leadership is not seen as a noble task. It's seen as a task to be criticized, critiqued, um, assailed, devalued. Now, that may be true in culture. I, I, I'm not gonna, I can't speak about a, 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 a Scandinavian, Norwegian, Danish culture. I can't speak about that. But I can speak about biblical culture. And God loves to raise people up. And in doing so, it is a noble thing. Because if we're talking about influencing people, and God using us, he could do it, of course, without us, but God using us to influence people in this life, never mind their, total, their, their final eternal destination. Of course it's noble. Of course it's noble. And there is a false humility around in the, in the culture that likes to knock people down, but it's, it sort of leaks into the church. In Australia, they have a thing, they talk about the tall poppy syndrome. Have you heard of that? where if anybody sort of emerges above the, the sort of average of the crowd, then by definition they have to be chopped down. That is such an anti-biblical way of, it's just a pagan way of operating. I mean, isn't it astonishing? In the Old Testament, God identifies himself how? I am the Lord God of Abraham. The Lord God of Isaac, the Lord God of 
In other words, God associates his name and his personhood with human beings. And, and if you've ever looked carefully at the biographies of those gentlemen, I mean, it's not flawless. Hmm. You know, Abraham on one occasion, to get himself out of trouble, offered his wife as a prostitute. I mean, I've never tried that. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I hope you haven't. I mean, that's, that's pretty naughty, isn't it? We would reckon that's pretty naughty. And yet God chooses, do you see, my point is, flawed human beings, God associates, so it's quite legitimate. It's quite legitimate to talk about the Lord God of Eleanor Mumford, or the Lord God of Jay Pathak, or the Lord God of Anna, Anne and Fleming. And so we could go on around the room, I could just pick you out. That God, God identifies himself and his glory with individuals, and that would include leaders. So it is a noble task. It's a high calling. Not because of us, I hasten to add, but because of who God is and what he calls men and women to do. Paul had a very high profile in the early church. Timothy had a very high profile in the church of Ephesus because that needed to be the case. That's how God chose to work. And you could think of some of the heroes of the faith going back centuries the Lord God of Athanasius, who produced the creed and kept the church from heresy and kept us basically from all of us ending up as Jehovah's Witnesses. Or the Lord God of Martin Luther, particularly if you have a Lutheran background. Or in the United Kingdom, the Lord God of Thomas Cranmer. Or William Tyndale, who translated the Bible out of Latin into a language that we could understand. You, know, you could go on, couldn't you? The Lord God of General Booth. Lord God of Billy Graham. Men that God, men and women that God raised up. Catherine Booth, uh, uh, General Booth's wife. Her maiden name was Mumford, I'm glad to tell you. <laughs> but, and we're obviously related somewhere back in Norman times. But my point was that she, if you read the history books, he was the preacher, she, she was the pioneer, entrepreneur, developer. And they worked together beautifully. So it is a noble task. Okay, C carrying on, this is chapter three. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperament, um, <coughs> temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone doesn't know how to manage his own family, Paul writes, how on earth can you take care of God's church? It's logical, isn't it? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Jump, will you, across to chapter, I haven't got time to read all this, so jump across to chapter 4 now. And verse, well, verse 7, the second half of verse 7. Train, do you know that phrase, train yourself to be godly? So he's talking to Timothy and to leaders, and he's saying, train yourself to be godly. And this is, the, again, the point I'm making uh, about leadership is both who we are, it's about character, as well as what we do and gifting and talents that God may have given us. But you notice the emphasis here when he's just talking about the criteria. So what's, as it were, what's the checklist for people who are going to lead, and particularly people who are going to lead churches and lead clusters and movements of churches? What's the criteria? What's the checklist? And you notice in chapter 3, and here summarized in verse 7 of chapter 4, it is about character, about who we are. Train yourself to be godly. Physical Training is of, you know, going to the gym is of some value, yeah, yeah. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. 
This is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. This is a trustworthy saying when it comes to the Nordic region of the globe. It deserves full acceptance by those of you from the five nations. This is why we labor and strive in the Nordic region. Because we have put our hope in the living God. We have gambled. We have put our wad of money on the fact that there is a God. There is a living God. This is how he puts it in verse 10. Who is the savior, the rescue of all men and women in the Nordic region. Let's just start there. Especially those who follow Jesus. He's the savior, the rescuer. It's magnificent, isn't it? There is hope. Do you notice? We have put our hope, and as you know as well as I do, the word hope there, at least in the English language, I'm not sure about the Scandinavian languages, but in the English language, that word hope has been watered down and the meaning has been frittered away. Uh, so hope is a vague you know, possibility. Your fingers crossed it may happen or it may not. No, no, no. In the Bible, that means is rock-solid certainty. Take it to the bank and cash it certainty. Of all the things that you may be vague about and uncertain about, this is not that. This is in an entirely different category. This is as real as reality ever gets. Our certainty in the living God. That's what we've gambled on. We've wagered our lives on. And what else would you, <laughs> what else would you want to gamble on, wager on? Command and teach you these things. He says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. For those of you who have ears to hear, those of you who are younger, take note. Those of you who are older, take note. Don't be looked down upon if you're young and don't look down upon them if you're old. Okay? Agreed? Nod politely. Let's go on. Set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Set an example. You see, that's what leadership boils down to. It's, that's where influence comes from. It's not a question to do as I do, do as I say. No, set an example. Elsewhere, Paul says, imitate me, copy me. So my life has got to be of such integrity and godliness that it really is worth people who follow me repeating and, and copying and taking that as a, as a sort of template at least a goal to shoot from, to, to shoot for, a target to shoot for, I should say. Set an example to, to the believers in speech. When people knock into you, what comes out? Kindness or nastiness? When some, you're driving your car, some wretched cyclist comes out, and you have them in this country even more than we have them in ours. You know, and our culture is if you see a cyclist, well, at least it used to be, if you see a cyclist in your way, accelerate. <laughs> but you can't do that anymore. By law, but, but also it's not a godly thing to do. In speech, in conduct, in love, and in faith, and in purity... So these are the things that really matter. Which is why, you see, um, Paul goes into such detail. Let's come back to chapter 3 and a list here of things. Do you notice in verse 2, he says, Now the leader, that's you lot and us lot, is to be above reproach. Do you see that? Just at the beginning of verse 2. And then jump down with your eye, jump down to verse 7. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders. Think of it, some of you heard me talk about this before, think of it like a shelf of books with bookends. Do you call them that? 
And at one end, you've got verse 2, above reproach. And the other end, you've got, has a good reputation with outsiders, which is much the same. In other words, we're talking about integrity. And then in between these, he unpacks in some detail the sorts of things he's talking about, the sorts of criteria. And as I say, it's like a checklist. So above reproach. So people should look at you or look at me and they should say, we don't have any, we don't have any, anything on him or her that any information about them or any knowledge of their behavior or their lack of integrity that might disqualify them from doing what they're doing. And then you look at verse 7, a good reputation. Isn't it interesting that Paul here is talking about the church, but so often you think Paul has a line of argument and so often you think well, at the end of the corridor, in his thinking, Paul is going to turn right. Have you noticed? And as you come to the end of the corridor, blow me down, what does he do? He turns left. He goes in an opposite direction. You would think he was going to say, he must also have a good reputation with insiders, with people inside the church that he's leading. Yes? He doesn't say that. He says the opposite. He has a good reputation with outsiders, people outside the church. Maybe a, you know, aren't believers at all, followers of Jesus at all. Quite the opposite. He's saying that we, they oughtn't to be able to point and say, that person shouldn't be leading a church because of X or Y or Z. That's the standard we're called to. And, and do you notice, in passing, because I need to shut up in a minute, but do you notice here that the, what is the underlying assumption of verses 2, verse 2 to verse 7? With all these things, you know, him faithful to his wife, um, um, uh, temperate, in other words, not controlled by substances, whether wine or drugs or whatever, um, respectable, and that's not sort of middle-class respectability he's talking about. No, he's talking about um, being full of integrity, being... being um, uh, hang on, don't go away. Don't go away. I've got a good word here for it. Not given to extremes is temperate. Respectable. Integrity. That's what the word means. What, what a person, what you say and what you do interlock in a way that is seamless. That's what he's talking about. Hospitable, someone who loves people, opens, is able to show affection for them and love for them openly. It's a, they're known to love people. And you see it again and again with Paul. The heart and the affection and the passion with which he addresses those he's leading. Not violent, not ruled by their emotions. Yes, of course, when we're younger, our emotions control us, but how an older man deals with a volatile situation is very instructive. Someone who is gentle, the word here means someone who is secure, someone who has no need to prove anything to anyone. He's not constantly in the back of his mind wanting to seek the approval from his dead father. If only dad could see me now, he'd approve. No, no, someone who's secure and knows that he serves the Lord God, an audience of one, as we say. And he's not contentious, do you notice that? Not quarrelsome, not angry with himself or with others. Because people who are angry with themselves very often take it out on other people. And, and other people pay the bill that is not theirs to pay. Do you see, but the underlying assumption of all this, and I'm speaking to leaders now, remember, that these criteria, the underlying assumption here is scrutiny, is it not? In other words, for these things to, if you're going to have a checklist, and, and before you're going to lead, you've got to, you've got to be, we've got to make sure. I mean, why would you, when you first joined the vineyard, 
you assumed, didn't you, that somebody had been through this checklist with the person who was leading the vineyard. I mean, you'd be crazy to join a church. Now, you may not get to check them out on all these details, but you assume somebody has, didn't you? I mean, you'd be crazy to join a church if you didn't, because you may be, you know, you're, you're the leader may be a complete lunatic or a megalomaniac. You've no idea. Fleming could be a complete nutcase. So you haven't checked him out, but you assume, don't you, that somebody has. And somebody's been through this list and said, yes, we can say to you in all honesty, we've, we've um, checked Fleming out, and I have to tell you, and I'm delighted to tell you, that on every, every one of these he passes with flying colors. That's what you want to hear. You, you say, well, that's not fair, is it? Because why should I be scrutinized? You know, in these particularly human rights we have these days, it's, it's my personal stuff. It's none of your business, and I'm going to take you to the Hague if you, you know, if you come poking around in my life. Tough. That may be true in human rights. It may be true in the law in your country. It's not true in the scriptures. You want to be scrutinized. You and I want our leaders to be scrutinized so that, indeed, we, we are a band of brothers and sisters who are above reproach, and to have a good reputation with outsiders. Now, I know in many of you, the coffee alarm has just gone off. Ten, eleven 11 seconds ago, it went off, didn't it? And you start to salivate, and you start to shake, and you start to look at your watch, and Eleanor now is taking off her watch, and she's dangling it. You can't see, but she's doing that. So just out of spite, I'm going to go on for another half an hour. <laughs> no, no. Why don't we... Um, why don't we take a break? I've finished. Why don't you, and you need to be back here in 19 minutes, because we're going to start in 20 minutes. Ready, steady, go.